Well, thank you very much indeed, Craig. It's uh, great to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, it's great to be at an event that the LSE is hosting, and as one would expect with any event with the LSE involved, I've already been listening to a lot of rigorous discussion and analysis of policy options. But I think what we're also doing today is celebrating urbanism and celebrating what cities contribute to the world. They are drivers of innovation, which as Craig rightly said, is one of my crucial ministerial responsibilities. They're also drivers of creativity, and so that's why it's so right to be holding this event in one of London's great creative districts. And it was that kind of celebration that came across very vividly in the Prime Minister's speech, because Tech City itself is a great example of that. Now, what can we in Britain and in London in particular offer to what is now a global debate? Well, we were, of course, the first country to urbanize. We were the first country to go through that crucial benchmark where more than 50% of our population lived in cities. We went through that, according to the census, in the 1850s. That when, that's when more than half of England's population was living in cities. And that very same crucial hurdle of more than half of your population living in cities was passed by the world as a whole in 2008. And it does profoundly change the character of a society once it is urbanized on that scale. Of course, when we did it, the population of England in the 1850s was about 20 million. China is doing it with a population of 1.3 billion. So the challenges are on a different scale, but we find that there is continuing international interest in British expertise and engagement with urbanism. And cities are the places where a lot of the economic growth and the innovation happens. 80% of global GDP is generated in cities. 60% is generated in the world's top 600 cities. Though, of course, of those top 600 cities, at the moment, it's the 380 that are in the major, that are the major cities of the developed world that are, develop, that are generating 50% of global GDP. It's the other 220 cities of the developing world who are currently only generating 10% of world GDP. The shift in the balance between East and West, between conventional advanced economies and developing economies, the shift in the balance of urbanism over the next 20 years is going to be one of the crucial changes facing the world. Cities don't just generate uh, growth in the high tech, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. I buy the argument that if we go right back to the origins of urban living, right back into prehistory, it wasn't that advances in agriculture were made urban living possible, it was also humans coming together in greater concentrations that drove the need for more domestication of animals and more agriculture. The development of agriculture and urbanism went together. And if I can just report, because one of the fascinations of my job is seeing all these extraordinary research projects going on around the country, led by scientists and researchers and sponsored by our research councils, I think of going to a BBSRC research center in Yorkshire only a few months ago to see what might be the future of city agriculture. In the past, one of the problems with intense agriculture in warehouses was that conventional old-fashioned electric lighting, the bulbs generated so much heat that the distances, the spaces that were required were too great. Now with modern LED bulbs, that is not, you know, with LEDs, that is not a problem. So we've got teams of researchers that are working out the exact correct combinations of LED lighting in order to ensure that your broccoli or your tomatoes or your raspberries will grow most rapidly in neat ranks, only about a meter, just over a meter apart. And the absolutely clear objective is in future, there will be a warehouse around the back of the, your urban Tesco's where they will be growing a large proportion 
of the green produce that people go to buy. There are innovations and research underway in leading British research institutes to make that kind of thing happen. Well, as well as that agriculture, there are, of course, a lot of more uh, other areas of technological advance linked with the rise of urbanism. We need intelligent traffic management systems to avoid gridlock, something that was being touched on in the discussion when I arrived. We need sophisticated energy markets, again, something that was being touched on in the earlier discussion. Uh, cities are intense users of energy, and one of the areas, again, where we're leading the research agenda is to try to find smart ways of reducing energy demand. High-performance IT has itself become a major user of energy. Every time we're on Facebook, it consumes roughly the same amount of electricity as boiling a kettle. We have people who are locating their large uh, IT data handling capabilities in places like northern Sweden to try to lower on cooling costs. And although other countries are the leaders in high-performance computing, we are the leaders in energy-efficient high-performance computing, which is exactly the type of computing you want if you're going to have intense data centers located in urban areas. And we are the world leaders in energy-efficient computing because we write very smart algorithms, which mean you require fewer calculations and fewer individual processes in order to generate a particular uh, output from your IT system. So we look forward to the day when the IT computer load on our energy systems is reduced by sophistication in skill in the way in which the programs are written. As well as those type of developments, let me briefly review some of the commercial and um, policy initiatives that we're taking. We've obviously We've got the advantage of a range of firms with real expertise as providers of solutions, whether in specific vertical sectors such as traffic management or water management, or in the design and management of large scale projects that you need in order to develop future cities. And I know that many such firms are represented here today. And perhaps some of the firms that aren't here today are instead participating in the current UKTI-sponsored ministerial mission to Singapore, Malaysia, and Philippines, which is there specifically to explore opportunities for UK businesses in future cities in Asia right now. So we've already identified this as a priority for UKTI and trade attention. We've also launched our program of city deals. I find one of the good working rules for urbanism is there's usually someone called Greg Clark involved. And uh, my ministerial colleague, the ministerial Greg Clark, has driven that agenda, and he is, we're making great progress in deals which provide much greater autonomy to leading cities outside London, Birmingham, Manchester, than they've enjoyed for many decades. Many of you will be aware also of the Future Cities Demonstrator competition, which the TSB launched earlier this year worth 25 million pounds. Some 30 cities were successful with feasibility studies, and now the shortlist of four cities is being carefully studied to determine who, which city will be funded, and the final winner will be announced in January. Uh, as well as that, the, uh, alongside the, the, uh, that demonstrator, uh, the TSB, of course, is also establishing the Future Cities Catapult, which will uh, have a, play a crucial role. It will be different from some of the other catapult centers, the technology innovation centers. It won't simply look at technologies to support cities, future, uh, uh, future cities, important though that is. It'll also look at issues such as citizen behavior and the financing of new business models, exactly the type of cross-disciplinary approach that you're taking at this important conference today. And actually, some of the other catapults we've got such as connected digital economy, transport, will also have a role to play in enhancing our capability in urbanism. And then, of course, as well as that, within the framework of the industrial strategy, we have specifically got the information economy, a strand which um, I will be leading as the minister responsible, and we see future cities as very much playing into that. 
So if you look at that range of policy activity, you can see that alongside the agenda of the mayor, alongside the prime minister's powerful speech about Tech City, we're also trying to use our research strengths and the commitments of the TSB and the activities of the UKTI to grow and, and take international our expertise and capabilities in this area. I very much look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much indeed. Minister has time for a few questions from us, and we invite people in the audience. There are people out with yellow scarves and roving microphones. If you have a question, raise your hand. We've got one just to your, yeah, just, just right by you and one over there. I'm not going to say who you are. Well, what um, we plan to do is to launch our catapult uh, in the new year. The TSB are in the lead. I can't really add much at the moment other than to say that it, it is a shared uh, resource. It will be particularly, we think, of help to SMEs and startups who don't individually have the capability to study transport systems energy patterns but have ideas that they may have a specific project that is relevant, they will find at the Catapult Center experts who have already got the basic modeling and the basic understanding of those so that their particular projects and programs can be slotted in. But um, the detail will be launched by the TSB in the new year. Well, that's a very good question, and um, although there aren't any proposals on kind of changing political or institutional arrangements, uh, when, I look, uh, when I look at it, uh, first of all, from my perspective, uh, what I see is London as a center for higher education, in fact, education more generally, and several of our leading universities basically running out of space. I don't know how the LSE is doing on its campus, but there's a very interesting trend developing. There is UCL moving to have a second campus east on the old Carpenters Estate alongside the Olympic Park. And separately, you've got Imperial moving west with its second campus uh, out in Hammersmith, Shepherd's Bush. You put all that together and you start, and you then have a kind of connection out from Imperial out to Oxford and then up from uh, UCL via King's Cross up to Cambridge. You see a kind of arc of activity. Something that I'm very keen to do is to leverage further the capabilities of research activity. Only last week I announced that we would be looking for a different model for the National Physical Laboratory out at Teddington, which is a potentially very valuable and important campus that I'd like to see a more heavily used research centre for London. Uh, we, we thought that it needed a different model than Serco's management. They've done it very efficiently, but they've essentially been managers. And we're looking for a joint venture now between government and external partners that could be other universities, include could be international universities, to help us grow and develop that site, including, of course, but protecting it as a global centre of expertise in metrology. Um, so, uh, and that's before we move on to other investments, such as the investment which the Chancellor announced yesterday of a one billion pound, uh, a guarantee for one billion pound of funding to take the Northern Line out across to Battersea and the enormous development that is happening there. So yes, we are, although of course there are exciting things happening to the East, if you put together just what I've been able briefly to list, Battersea, Teddington, Imperial West, um, there is also a lot of activity out west as well. And I'm happy to say the LSE is at the center of London, <laughs> in all directions. <laughs> uh, 
um, Mark Sharma from ACTO. He had a lot for you this morning about what are the things that are happening. Um, but what about things that you feel are stuck, things that aren't happening? Um, well, what we endlessly discuss in Cabinet, and which quite, quite rightly the Prime Minister and the Chancellor hold the rest of us to account, is just getting on with implementing our objectives in the uh, growth strategy. Uh, that can mean planning delays. Uh, it can mean delays in getting the state aid approvals in order for us to deliver the rollout of superfast broadband. Uh, so there are those types of obstacles. Um, I'm keen to see even more expansion of uh, London as a global centre for education, and it's a theme I want to take forward in the education strand of our industrial strategy, which I'll also be leading. Um, and in terms of delays, I've also been frustrated by the delays in the Galileo satellite programme, and that's relevant for cities, very relevant for cities, because GPS, when you're only using the American satellite system, GPS doesn't always work in crowded urban areas with skyscrapers. There are too many places where there's a shadow that stops the full performance of GPS. What you do when Galileo arrives, not to mention the arrival of also some Russian and Chinese systems, is you at least double the number of satellites available for positioning services and you increase the chances that people in urban areas are able to get extremely accurate uh, global positioning data. So, uh, and one of my responsibilities is space, so we try to push that agenda forward and there are so many interactions in today's high-tech world, I think, paradoxically, that the delays in Galileo have been have a direct relevance to the kind of level of service you can offer in a in a system. Sabas Verdes from LFC Cities. We heard in the previous panel uh, the sometimes tension between uh, city government and national government. Uh, city government is taking a uh, step forward. What happens when you have tensions, for example, when you want to promote higher education uh, and you have national government restricting, for example, student visas? How does your government deal with this tension between uh, at the city and the national level? The, well, I mean, the visa issue, I know it has been a challenge and I, uh, and I recognize the, the challenge to our perceptions of Britain internationally from the uh, from, Lon from the London Met episode, but there, there is no limit on the number of legitimate students that can come to London or Britain as a whole in order to study. And that's very important and we are, uh, uh, and we have, uh, and that's um, an environment that we need to communicate. And I personally need to communicate and all of us in the government, uh, especially to markets like India, where there are misapprehensions and misunderstandings about our policy. I have to say though, Pushing the challenge back, your assumption was that there are cities that wish to grow their universities and there are national policy constraints. It doesn't always feel like that. Uh, and, all, and the example I'm about to give, uh, they, they, the university involved always dislike it when I cite them, but Oxford, for example, which should be, I think, a growth centre for higher education, there is a deal between Oxford University and the council, as far as I can tell, really, set by the council, which limits that, which states there will only be 3,000 Oxford students in private rented accommodation, which means if you want to grow Oxford the, it, via their collegiate system, you need to build new student accommodation before you can grow it. So uh, I have other stories from university vice chancellors of the difficulties of getting planning permission for extra student accommodation. So where I am, it sometimes looks as if the constraints are not set always nationally. There are sometimes uh, local councils that are tr trying to stop the growth of a very dynamic and important uh, global uh, British opportunity. sometimes reproduce the sort of silo-based thinking which is common within institutions and governance or has been, which mm. is one of the challenges we absolutely need to address and resolve in a sense. 
when I look at the catapult sensing and the way this is a mirror kind of that side of those thinking, you know, we have manufacturing, cities, transport systems, renewable energy and the economy all as separate catapults. Surely you would want a uh, business idea to emerge which manufactured transport system is based around renewable energy, perhaps new satellite systems, and they're seen as part of a wider context. So a sort of more joined up thinking, how are the catapults going to mm. address that issue? Yeah, I, I mean, it is a fair point. Uh, uh, however, you do need some boundaries somewhere. I mean, you can't just do everything everywhere. Uh, and you need a kind of a spine, a shape to individual entities. Uh, sometimes I get the opposite criticism from yours. Sometimes I get the criticism that our catapult centers are too broad. And if you compare them with, say, the German Fraunhofer Institutes, on which to some extent they're modeled, Germany has many more Fraunhofer Institutes. I can't remember the exact number, but certainly over 50 in more precise technological areas than our catapults. So sometimes I get told to narrow rather than to broaden. Uh, what they are all intended to be is multidisciplinary. And as I s hope I said in my speech, um, um, the future cities catapult in particular is, going, is intended to not simply look at technologies, but also issues around citizen behavior, financing and new business models. And I think that given cities are the places where all these different technologies, disciplines, forms of human experience come together, I hope that will certainly be embodied in that catapult above all. David, can I take the liberty of asking a last question myself? Um, having just moved here from New York, a city which bemoaned uh, a shortage not just of, of investment in the last steps before commercialization of new technologies, but of uh, training in engineering and the strength of the education sector in the background of this, and thus this led to the uh, Bloomberg-led initiative that brought uh, Cornell University and the Technion and the creation of a major new engineering school uh, to the city. I wonder if there's thinking in London that goes beyond some of what we've heard about the support for the Silicon Roundabout and the support for the steps very close to the immediate commercialization of new technologies. For example, to um, secure the existence of major kinds of engineering, architecture, um, design support in the city and education. Mm. No, I, I, I agree with that, but that, that's actually one of the areas where I am an, an, an optimist. Uh, I think, first of all, it's clear that education is one of London's strengths at all levels. It looks as if the school's revolution happened in London earlier and has been sustained more. An interesting research, not least done by my former researcher, Chris Cook, now with the Financial Times, showing the, that it looks as if London schools outperform and standards have been rising in London schools for longer and reaching higher levels than elsewhere. And of course, at the other end of the spectrum, one of the other great things about London is mature students. Often, when people want to change, take a different educational or career direction in their lives that often involves coming to London and going as a mature student to Birkbeck or somewhere else and getting a new set of skills. London is a place where you come. It could even, if anything, from being made redundant, a marriage broken up, just become dissatisfied with the course your career has taken. It, resha reshaping your life might well involve moving into a city and particularly moving to London, and we are very strong in London at that. Uh, I Looking to America, and the less, I think there are two lessons from America. First of all, we are specifically, are learning from the Mayor Bloomberg competition. And although it's on a more modest scale, what I described a few minutes ago about our competition for the future of, Tedding, of the Teddington site is modeled on what we have observed in New York. That is, there is a substantial site at Teddington. It is currently underused. We are going to invite partners, and they can be overseas, they needn't be British, to come and do joint ventures with us and develop that site, recognizing a particular expertise in metrology. And final point, uh, something else I've learned from the US that probably doesn't apply so much in London, this is less of a problem in London, but does apply to some other centers. You notice it in America, universities are also used as instruments of what I might call demographic competition. You use cities that want to revive themselves 
use universities to attract young people, and there is then a clear stickiness. If you've got a lot of young people coming to your city to study at a prestigious university, quite a few of them stay. Now, London has a very favorable demographic structure, but I've had this conversation in places like Newcastle, where it's clear that the strength of Newcastle University, and also University of Northumbria, where Johnny Ive studied design, is, is one of the things that is keeping, that they see as ensuring a continuing flow of young people into Newcastle. And I think America is much more adept at that. City authorities are much more aware of how they can use cities to change their demographic and, and keep it young and renewing itself. And I think that's why I was so frustrated in answering the earlier question about the attitude of some councils towards universities. I personally think university growth is one of the ways in which a city can ensure it has a dynamic, prosperous, and vigorous future. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.